Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone out to this Wednesday evening Bible study as we're going to look into the subject of sin. And, of course, the Bible talks a great deal about the subject of sin. We, we could go into the different lists of sins that were given in the Bible, and they're all throughout the Bible, but we're going to focus in on some more specifics tonight. Now, sin could be defined as the breaking of God's law set forth in the Bible. And actually, the word sin is an old archery term, which when the archer would shoot and miss his place, it would be referred to as missing the mark or sin. So sin is when we miss the mark and break God's law that's given to us in the Bible. Of course, we know that sin came into the picture in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve, they ate the forbidden fruit. And that broke the relationship with God and mankind was punished. Mankind was punished by a woman having to experience pain in childbearing and that man had to work by the sweat of his brow and the ground would produce thorns and thistles. And again, that relationship was broken with God and they were cast out of the garden. Now, sin does separate us from God. The Bible tells us that. So to start off our study this evening, open up your Bibles with me to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, and we'll just look at verses 1 through 2, which says this, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So here's what happens. When we're born, we're sinless, we're innocent, and we're new. But over time, we grow, right? And when we grow, we eventually start to understand what sin is. And then we do sin, and that sin separates us from God. The Bible lets us know that if we say that we do not sin, that we're a liar, and the truth isn't in us. The Bible also says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I mean, think about it. When we read about the man after God's own heart in the Bible, David, he sinned on different occasions that are recorded in the Bible, and I'm sure he, has sin he sinned on other occasions that were not recorded in the Bible. And sin does, again, separate us from God. And since sin separates us from God, we know that he turns a deaf ear to our prayers when we're living lost in sin. We don't have fellowship with God. We are on the path to hell and we have to obey Jesus Christ to get back on track with God and be saved. And truly, sin is running rampant in this world. Rampant everywhere. I mean, think about it. You, you watch a TV show nowadays, and you have sin shoved right in your face. You're always hearing foul words that people are speaking. You're always hearing of drugs being sold and trafficked and people hurting other people and just all kinds of horrible things. Sin is running rampant in this world everywhere. So this evening, let's look at a few different categories that sins fall into. The first type of sin that we're going to look at is the sin of commission. The sin of commission. Now, a sin of commission is an overt sinful act. Uh, they're sinful acts uh, because we are doing something that we are not supposed to do, and we know we're not supposed to do that. Examples of a sin of commission would be lying or idolatry or swearing or murder. When people commit such acts, they are committing a sin of commission. They know they're not supposed to do that, but yet they do it anyway. Now, take, for instance, the Israelites. Once they were uh, led out of Egyptian bondage and through the Red Sea, and uh, the uh, water came crashing in on Pharaoh's army, I mean, they, they were in the wilderness wandering, and God gave them direction. He told them, what the Ten Commandments were in Exodus chapter 20. But a little while after that, in Exodus chapter 32, Moses is up on Mount Sinai and he's talking to the Almighty God, receiving the two tablets that have the Ten Commandments on them. But 
the people down below, the Israelites, they grow impatient. So they pressure Aaron to make them an idol that they can worship. And one of the Ten Commandments was they were not to make idols, not to worship idols. I mean, and we are not to do that today. But Aaron caves under the pressure, and he takes and makes them a golden calf, and they bow down to it, they worship, and they sacrifice to it, and they indulge in all kinds of sinfulness. They knew better, but they committed that sin anyway. That was a sin of commission. Now, another example of a sin of commission is in 2 Kings 5. And in 2 Kings 5, we, of course, read about Naaman, the leper, who comes to Elisha, wants to be healed. Elisha tells him to dip seven times in the Jordan River. After Naaman had some sense talked into him, he actually does go and dip seven times in the Jordan River, and he's declared clean. So then Naaman... Cleansed from his leprosy, goes back to Elisha, and he offers him some gifts, right? You know, thanking him for this healing. And, of course, Elisha, being the prophet of God and being the good man that he was and having all that he needed, he said, no, I don't want any of that. I don't want any of the things that you're offering. But then something happened. We see a sin of commission take place. So look with me in 2 Kings 5, and we're going to read verses 19 through 27. 2 Kings 5, 19 through 27. There it says, Go in peace, Elisha said. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman the Aramean by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot and met him. Is everything all right? he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, Two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied them up, the two talents of silver and the two bags and the two sets of clothing. He gave them, uh, uh, gave them to two of his servants, and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away, and they left. Then he went in and stood before his master Elisha. Where have you been, Gehazi? Elisha asked. Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the men got down from the chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothing, olive groves, vineyard, flocks, herds, men servants or maid servants? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and your descendants for, forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and he was leprous, as white as snow. So Gehazi let greed get the best of him, and he went on what I would like to call a sinning spree. Now, what were the sins that he committed? Well, he didn't ask his master's permission. He should have done that. But he was greedy, and being a greedy person... Loving money is very evil. And then we see one lie after another. I mean, he told Naaman that Elisha had sent him. He lied about a couple prophets coming. And then he lied to his master. And we see all kinds of deception here. We see one sin after another. And that's what happens with sin a lot of times is it's this domino effect that one lie leads to another lie, leads to another lie, and leads to another lie. Yet Elisha, the prophet of God... Being a servant of God, being a prophet of God, he knew Gehazi's sin, which reminds us all that we can't hide anything from the Almighty God. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So we see this sin of commission, this sin that we overtly do, that we, that we commit even though we, we know better than to do it. And I'm sure we've all been guilty of committing a sin of commission before. But let's now move to the sin of omission. The sin of omission. To omit something is to leave something out of your life. 
So the sin of omission, sins, sins of omission are acts left undone. Things that God expects us to do, but we don't do them. Take for instance, those of us who are Christians know that we are to live out the Great Commission. I mean, as a preacher, I preach about that often. I remind us about that often, that Jesus said in Matthew 28, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus said that. When Jesus said, therefore, go, that's a command that he's given us. But sometimes we Christians can be guilty of not telling people about Christ, of not going out into the world like we should, of, of not living out the Great Commission. And therefore, we are committing a sin of omission. We're omitting that from our life, acting like we don't need to live out that command. But it is the job, and I stress, it is the job of every Christian to help seek and to save the lost. And we're all in this together, then we should be wanting to win people to Christ every day because there are people dying every day and are headed on the path to hell. So that's a sin of omission. Turn with me in your Bibles over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. James 4, and look in verse 17. And there the scriptures say, Anyone then who knows the good he ought to, 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 ought to do and doesn't do it sins. Now listen to that again. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. Now Jesus did give us a couple parables about this. And I want us to kind of look at those parables. One parable is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And just to kind of remind you of that story, we read about a time when there's a man going on the road to Jericho, and he's jumped by a bunch of bandits who beat him, strip him of his clothes, steal everything he, he has, and leave him laying on the side of the road for dead. But then there comes this, this priest this basically you could say nowadays to be a preacher, right? And he goes on by, sees the guy laying there, but he probably thinks, well, you know, I'm so busy, I need to hurry up and get to the temple. And he goes on, he just ignores the guy laying there. A Levite comes by, he sees the man laying there, he knows he should help, but he just ignores the situation and goes on. But then a Samaritan man comes by, and the Samaritan looks at this man, has compassion for him, he cleans up his wounds and puts him on his animal and takes him to an inn and pays for him to be provided for. This was a good Samaritan. Now here's the deal. This priest and this Levite, they would know that they should help their fellow man if they see him beaten up and laying on the side of the road because they would have been students of the Bible. They would have known what the Old Testament said. So turn with me and let's see what the Old Testament says about this. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 15. Deuteronomy 15. And let's look at verse 11. Deuteronomy 15, 11. And there the Old Testament says, There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore I command you to be open-handed toward your brothers and toward the poor and needy. In the land. Now, this man laying beat up on the side of the road with this Levite and this priest went by, he was definitely needy because he could have laid there and he could have been killed, or an animal could have found him laying there bleeding and started feasting on him and he could have died that way. I mean, he was in a situation where he was definitely needy. But what these men did was they committed a sin of omission, knowing they needed to help, but they didn't help in that situation just like christians should live out the great commission and when we don't we're omitting that from our lives now a second parable about this same subject is in matthew chapter 25 and i love matthew 25 if you want to go ahead and turn there in your bibles i'd appreciate it and in matthew 25 we read the parable of the judgment day where jesus is going to return and when we know when jesus returns he's going to judge the world and he's going to separate us sheep on his right 
goats on his left, sheep being Christians, being saved, the goats being the lost. And he says some specific words here to the goats and to the sheep. But in Matthew 25, look at what he says, verses 41 through 46. And it says, Then he will say to those on his left, the, you know, talking about the goats, Depart from me, you are, who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they'll go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So he's telling, telling us on the great judgment day, that not only will our sins of commission be brought out, not only the sins like lying, cheating, stealing, and murder, not only will these be brought out, but also the things that we didn't do, the sins of omission, will be brought out on the great judgment day. So we can understand what these two types of sin are, and we can look at our own lives and examine ourselves and say, you know, what have I been omitting from my life that the Lord expects of me? What sins of commission and what sins of omission have I been committing? Now, there's one more type of sin that I'd like to speak of. And, and this isn't spoken of a whole lot, but I think it's important that we're reminded of this. We're going to talk just briefly about the unpardonable sin. And this is found in Mark chapter 3. If you want to turn there with me in your Bibles. Mark chapter 3. In Mark 3... Some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law were accusing Jesus of performing miracles by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. So basically, they were saying that Jesus was performing all these miracles, that he was casting out demons by the devil instead of by the Holy Spirit of God. And because of this, Jesus decides he's going to line them out. Okay, so let's look here in Mark 3, verses 23 through 29. And there it says, So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. So that makes a lot of sense, you know, without unity, when there's division then, then this couldn't happen. But Jesus is saying this to open the eyes of the Pharisees and teachers of the law to show them, I'm not doing this by Satan. Everything I do is by the power of the Almighty God through the blessed Holy Spirit of God. And then he says in verse 27, In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth. All sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. Now, a lot of people are concerned when they hear this. They think, oh no, have I committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? But I, I tell you what, if you are concerned and you think, oh no, did I do that? Then, then you haven't committed that sin because you have a receptive heart that is repentant of your sins. So you haven't committed that sin if you have that concern. So blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is called the unpardonable sin. Now in this context, the context of Mark 3, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and teachers of the law. And these Pharisees and teachers of the law had seen with their own eyes the miracles of Jesus. Now think about that. They had witnessed with their own eyes Jesus casting out demons. They had witnessed with their own eyes Jesus healing the sick. They had seen the proof that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. They had seen this proof 
And they, they knew that this was backed up by the Old Testament scriptures because they were devout students of the Old Testament. And yet they willfully rejected Jesus. And they willfully rejected the Old Testament scriptures and willfully rejected that his work was done by the Holy Spirit of God. And they did that because they had these hard hearts that would not accept and obey Jesus. Now the Bible tells us that all the scripture, that all the Bible is given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Or other translations of the Bible say all scripture is God breathed. Or in other words, we could say that all scripture comes to us by the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit, he even helps us recall the teachings of Christ as John 14 and verse 26 tells us. So when people today have hard hearts like these Pharisees and teachers of the law and they willfully reject the written word, which is the work of the Holy Spirit, and they willfully reject Christ, then they are living a life in the unpardonable sin like the Pharisees who rejected Christ and rejected the Holy Spirit, which he is doing his miracles by. The reason it's the unpardonable sin is because their hearts are so hard that they'll never be brought to belief and repentance and obedience of God's plan of salvation. And the reality is, God wants all people to be saved. Even those who consider themselves the worst of sinners. Remember Saul of Tarshish? And he breathed out murderous threats against the church. And he loved the Old Testament law. And he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And he, did, he calls himself the worst of sinners. But the Lord showed his patience and how he will forgive anyone through and by Saul of Tarsus. Because he became the Apostle Paul and wrote the majority of the New Testament that we read today. We also read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3-4 through 4, that this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So we read multiple times that God wants all men to be saved. But in order to be saved, we have to do our part and accept and obey the Lord. So we have these three different types of of sin that we've spoken about tonight. And I just want to give us a little review here as we're starting to wrap up. The sin of commission. Sins that we do that, that we know we're not supposed to do. And that's like lying, stealing, cheating, murdering. Sins of omission. When we leave things out of our lives that God wants us to have in our lives. Like taking care of the, the sick, taking care of the hungry, checking on people in prison, uh, praying for people, living out the Great Commission, things like that. And then there's the unpardonable sin, which is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, and that's when people reject the Word of God, which is given to us, which is all God-breathed, which is all given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When people reject the Word, they are rejecting the Spirit, they are rejecting salvation, and their heart is so hard that they will not be brought to repentance and therefore they are living in that sin of the unpardonable sin. So we have these three categories. And of course, uh, I think it's vital that we all remember that the only way to have pardon and remission of our sins is to obey and live for Jesus Christ. And remember, Jesus left heaven to come to earth to teach us the way that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus laid down his life. No one took it from him. No, he laid it down on the cross of Calvary, and he raised it up again and raised from the grave, walked amongst man, and ascended back to the Father. And one glorious day, our Savior, the only Savior, is going to come back and judge the world. So we need to be ready. We need to have pardon and remission of our sins. We need to be on track to heaven by living out God's plan of salvation outlined in the Word. That plan being to hear the Word of God, as Romans 10, 17 tells us to believe the Word of God, as John 8 and verse 24 tells us that we must repent of our sins, as Luke chapter 13, verses 3 through 5 tells us we must confess Christ before our fellow man. As Matthew 10, 32 tells us, we must be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins 
into the name of the Lord for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then as Mark 16, 16 tells us, and we must live faithfully to the end. As Romans 2, 10 tells us, if we do, we'll receive that crown of eternal life. And I want to encourage you, if you need to make a decision to obey the Lord, or if you just need us to pray with you, give me a call. Our office number is 606-723-4791. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come before you and we pray for the healing of all the sick, Lord. We uplift each one that's on the prayer list at church, Lord. We pray that you intervene and heal them and that you comfort those that are grieving and that you be with all our military men and women and all our first responders, EMTs, firefighters, Lord, and just, just keep them healthy. I pray that you bless our church family here at Rice Station Christian Church, Father, and, and I pray that we will shine our light to this world. We thank you for your word whereby we can study and be reminded of sins of commission and sins of omission and how we need to be people who stand against sin and promote your word and your righteousness, Father. Thank you for Christ Jesus. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And we pray all this in Christ Jesus' holy name. And amen.